Hello, good afternoon to you and welcome to Midday Live from the News Hub at Adesoe Kanda. I'm Natalie Ford. A look at our top stories this afternoon. National Association of Graduate Teachers, NAGRAT, gives government two weeks to pay their salary arrears and transfer grants. Also, climate change predicted to reduce output in Ghana's grains by 26.5% in the year 2050. And on the international front, South Africa's ruling Africa National Congress to announce current President Jacob Zuma's successor as party leader on Sunday. I've got the details of these stories for you here on Midday Live, including the latest from the world of sports and entertainment. You're streaming all across the world on 3news.com and TV3 Gone on Facebook. Let's get on with our very first story this afternoon. The National Association of Graduate Teachers, NAGRAT, has given government two weeks to pay their salary arrears and transfer grants. National President of NAGRAT, Christian Adaipoku, gave the warning at a news conference in Accra. So as I said, the National Association of Graduate Teachers, that's NAGRAT, given government two weeks to pay the salary arrears and transfer grants. National President of NAGRAT, Christian Adai Poku, gave this warning at a news conference here in Accra. We're now going to be interacting with Daniel Opoku, who's our labor correspondent, and he's got the details of this issue. Daniel, good afternoon. Thanks for joining yeah, us. Now, how many months of salary arrears are we talking about, Daniel? Right. NAGRAT is asking from 2010 up to 2017. Mm -hmm. There were three key issues that they raised. First one has to do with salary arrears. The second one is about transfer grants. And the third one is the vehicular maintenance allowance. And these are in arrears from 2013 to date. Now, when we look at the transfer grants, so 2013 up to now, government is owing them around 13 million Ghana cities. Mm. 30 million Ghana cities. And with the transfer, with the vehicle maintenance allowance, government is owing them about 36 million Ghana cities. So these are the arrears that government has to pay to them from 2013 up to 2017, which, as I said, you have not been paid to them. And Daniel, you're saying, can you call out the transfer grants amount again? And each, of the, each, of, the, each of the amount. You mentioned the transfer grants is 13 million uh, Ghana cities. Yeah, they mentioned transfer grants and vehicle maintenance allowance. With a transfer grant, government is supposed to pay them around 13 million Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. That teachers who are involved are supposed to receive 13 million Ghana cities with a transfer grant. And with a vehicle maintenance allowance meant for, that's around 36 million Ghana cities. Teachers within the Ghana Education Service who, in fact, these things are part of the conditions of service that government is paying to them. And with a transfer grant, those who receive transfer to the various deprived areas, they are raised for the 13 million Ghana cities that government has to pay to them from 2013 up to now. And what is to them? They say that they are engagement with government. That they indicate that government is willing to. And all these things have been captured in the 2017 budget. And so, for them, what is so much surprised is the fact that even though it has been captured in the 2017 budget, they don't see the willingness of government to say. And all the engagements and meetings with the Minister of, with the Minister of Education has not been able to yield any. So do you see any sense of confidence in them, of governments actually coming through within this two weeks period that they've given? Now, when, we, when we speak to the leadership of, when we speak the leadership of that, we realize that they have lost confidence. But he said government gave them a promise that their arrears were going to be paid. And 11 months, almost getting to the end of the year, they don't see any signs of payment. For them, they have lost confidence. And they are saying that within two weeks, by the end of this month, they will not be part of the next academic year, which begins somewhere in January. 
Very well. Daniel, grateful for that update. We'll come through to you subsequently. That's Daniel Opoku, who's our labor correspondent, giving us the details on that. Let's turn to other stories now in education and health. Following the discovery of H1N1 influenza and meningitis at some senior high schools across the country, the Ghana Health Service, together with the Ghana Education Service, have instituted some measures to prevent spurda further spread of the disease. Now, the Ghana Education Service says it has started taking delivery of vaccines, some of which have been administered to staff and students at the Kumasi Academy in the Ashanti region where the first case of H1N1 influenza were recorded. The other arrivals, Tamiflu, is expected in the country from December 15. Now, I've been joined in the studio by Kojo Asiedu Ode. He's the PR officer of the Greater Accra Regional Ghana Education Service Office. Now, grateful. Thanks so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you so much. We are all, the entire Ghana is incredibly worried about this particular outbreak at schools. And what I just read earlier from the Education Service says some vaccines have been, been administered to the staff and the students at Kumasi Academy, where the first breakout started. Are the vaccines that have been administered there sufficient in your view? Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, what was administered was what the medics will call the antiviral agents. The antiviral agents were just to contain the situation to prevent the spread of the influenza or the 2009 H1N1 that has been identified by the medical authorities. So for now, it has been good. We have not recorded any new case according to the, the Ghana Health Service. So it's sufficient? So for now, for now it's sufficient. Uh, as also put out in the DG's uh, press release yesterday, according to who and the Ghana Health Service, they are uh, airlifting a number of dozens of what the vaccines proper to be arriving in this country today and tomorrow. That's the drugs for the containment and the vaccines that will arrive tomorrow. So I think we have been assured enough. So we are telling parents to be rest assured that the situation is seriously under control. There's no cause for alarm. So you say these vaccines are to arrive latest by tomorrow? Yes, latest by tomorrow. And uh, over the weekend, the administration... And we know that the students, the schools, are vacating this weekend, a number of them this weekend, and next week. Yeah. What's the time frame with the getting these students actually vaccinated? As I said, latest by today and tomorrow. It's arriving tomorrow. Will they be vaccinated tomorrow? Yes, once they're arriving, the, the medical team is on the standby, according to the Ghana Health Service and the Ministry of Health, to begin administering to students and staff of uh, Kumaka and everything is under control for now. Every student on campus, every staff on campus will go through this vaccination before they go on vacation. That is 22nd uh, Friday, December. Okay, but we know that Kumaka was the first school that kicked off this outbreak, we should say. But there are other schools involved. How are, what, are, what measures have you put in place with them? And these schools we know are in different regions. They're not all in the Ashanti region. It's spread across. Are you, is the Ghana, is, are you equipped enough to have all these other students and teachers? Yeah, Kumaka is peculiar with uh, the H1N1. But the other schools that we're talking about, they are with meningitis. They are, yes. Meningitis, you know, they are a bit different. They are almost not the same. They are all in containment as we talk now. There have been one or two unfortunate death uh, situations reported in uh, Kofodia Second Technica. Damango um, secondary yeah. technical, Boko secondary technical, but just one, one, one cases that we have reported, they have all um, been sent to the appropriate quarters for treatment. Those who have been affected, they have been discharged. Mm -hmm. Just unfortunate, one, one situation of death cases happening, but the rest so far is very much under control. How about when these students return from school, resume after vacation? Do you have plans on screening them again? Yes, the Ghana Health Service have actually increased surveillance in all the schools, even those non-affected. So they are on top of the issues. They are, I think there's a plan for now to ensure that at least every student will receive some sort of vaccination before they reopen. And maybe I have to appeal to the general public, even parents, when our children come home, let's try and get some sort of vaccination for them, especially during this era, era that we have for the meningitis uh, breaking. You know, it is not the first time has been a system from 2010 and all these days during the heat uh, uh, period in this country uh, october to march every year according to the various reports of Ghana health service we have this outbreak not only in the schools 
even some in our district and in our homes. So it is not a peculiar case for this particular year, even though we are not covering up for any unfortunate incident that will happen in our school. So would you say that the collaboration between the Ghana Education Service and the Ghana Health Service is strong enough? So in matters of health, we are always consulting with the Ghana Health Service and they are our best advices in terms of this. So anything, we just go to them. My Data General, Professor Kwesi Amankwa, is always in talk with the Director of Public Health Service, Dr. Sarkodie. He's always advising us what to do and what not to do. In terms of this, they are telling us, our peoples, avoid crowding yourself or avoid anything that will generate additional heat, taking a lot of water report any kind of um, headache or fever that you are feeling to the property so we'll be sent to the hospital for immediate treatment in order to prevent uh, mortality or any casualties being recorded very well we're hoping it'll be contained thank you so much kojo asiedu or the ipr officer on ghana education service grateful for your time Turn to other stories now. A senior research fellow of the Institute of Economic Affairs, Professor Asafu Ejei, has predicted climate change will reduce output in Ghana's grains by 26.5% by the year 2020. 2050, he made this revelation at a roundtable discussion on findings of a research work on climate change in the three regions of the north. It is expected that climate change will adversely affect the livelihood of smallholder farmers in many parts of Africa. African smallholders are particularly vulnerable to adverse changes in agroclimate conditions due to low technological and economic capabilities and a generally unfavorable institutional and economic environment. According to findings by research fellow of the Institute of Economic Affairs, Professor Jonas Afwaji, there is no significant difference in the type of fertilizer used for maize so long as sowing is undertaken in the first or second windows. Climate change, he said, has affected maize yields with current and alternative crop soil management practices. I also estimated that household incomes will also decline by about 16% around the same time. The impact on real GDP will be about 12.4%. So this is looking at a business as usual scenario. In other words, if we don't do anything, and uh, if things progress as they are uh, by 2040, the, the impact on GDP alone will be about 12.4%, uh, around 12% per annum. Professor Safwaji said if measures are not taken to check the effects, climate change could be devastating, especially in the three regions of the north. Don't think it's at the top of the agenda. Uh, and the reason is that you see, climate change is a very slow process, so it, it all doesn't happen at once. You know, occasionally you might have a, a drought or you, might, you, must ha you could have flood and the government could react to it, but the actual change is very little. You know, so so when, when the temperature increases, you may not even sense it. It's just a small 0 0.01 degrees over time, but the effects are very devastating because even a 0 0.01 degree increase in temperature can affect the ecosystem. Future climate change is projected to be associated with a delayed onset of rains. Let's move to some other stories this afternoon. Government has said it remains committed to reforming the public sector and making it responsive to the needs of business, private sector and the citizenry. A new public sector reform strategy is therefore being developed based on three core principles referred to as the three P's of the public sector reforms. Now, these three P's are a new direction of purpose, building the capacity of people who deliver the public service and streamlining the processes to ensure responsiveness, efficiency and effectiveness in service delivery at all levels of governance. Now, Professor Justice Baule is the co-chair of the technical committee that drew up the public sector reforms document. He's also the head of Department for Public Administration and Health Services Management at the University of Ghana Business School. And he joins me on Skype now to further probe this issue. Professor Baule, grateful for your time this afternoon. Thank you for having me. Now, Prof, this is not the first time that such committees or proposals have been put together for public sector reforms. In your view, what made the ones done in the past not up to par? And what, what would be different with this particular one that has been put up recently? Well, thank you. I, I think that in terms of a, a, a holistic or if you like a, a broad-based strategy, this is the first time Ghana is doing a public sector reform strategy. Uh, that is not to say that we have not done uh, reform. So we have had, if you like, sporadic um, 
yeah. standalone reforms that have bordered on different aspects of um, public sector management. Uh, and many of these have been in different areas, either in HR uh, reforms or, if you like, educational reforms that saw the uh, uh, DHS, SHS system as we have it now. Uh, there are reforms in, in areas of uh, financial uh, 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 regulation and reforms in financial uh, uh, revenue mobilization and all of that. So there have been significant numbers of reforms in different sectors of our uh, public sector. What we haven't had in the past is that we have not had a reform strategy that gave direction to these um, isolated reforms. And that is why this is different. So what this does is that it gives us a unified strategy, a strategy that looks at the public sector holistically and tries to come out with an element that allows us to um, uh, improve performance within the public sector. I'd like in particular three, we're talking about redefining the purpose of public service in ways that do not allow the public service to be self-serving, but to, be, to focus on serving uh, the business and the citizens. We also are looking to see what are the persons or the people who deliver service, what are their capacities, uh, are they motivated enough, are they capacitated enough to be able to, to do what we ask of them. And of course, we also are mindful that doing these things will involve processes. And so what are, the, what are the systems that we put in place? And how are these processes and systems um, oriented to proper, uh, effective public service delivery? These are the, the, if you like, the anchors of it. But these anchors are you know, further broken down into six pillars. And these pillars are the things that are going to be driving uh, the various parts of the reform uh, um, strategy. Uh, and so the six, there are six pillars that we, are, we have worked on. Uh, pillar one talks about a citizen and private sector focused public sector. Uh, pillar two is a capable and disciplined workforce. Uh, pillar three talks about strengthened public sector regulatory framework. Pillar four is modernized and improved working conditions. Pillar five is strengthened local government structures. And pillar six is digitized public sector services and systems. So we have these pillars which will be driven by the three P's. Uh, what are we reforming? We are reforming the purpose, we are reforming the people who will deliver the service, and we are reforming the processes. So that is what we've been working on, and that is what uh, we, we just uh, done the uh, validation workshop in Accra, and on uh, uh, Monday, we will do a validation workshop in Kutiasu. Yeah. Very well. Professor Baole, now that brings me to my next question. You find that a lot of these individuals who are involved in the public sector, when placed in private sector settings, tend to be more efficient and more effective in their delivery. How exactly are we hoping to put in that private sector effectiveness and efficiency translated into the public sector? Yeah, so what we... Uh, let me give you a little background to this. Perhaps that uh, uh, would partly answer the question. The question has been, what do we need to do? And, and I am sure the senior minister said this, that this strategy was developed um, uh, in the NDC era. But when this government took over, uh, we got convened. And what else was that, well, look here, we are a private sector-minded business. We, I mean, the government. We wanted to see a focus on the private sector and a focus on delivering effective and efficient services to citizens. So we were asked to, if you like, uh, put a private sector toast to the to the strategy and that's what we've done so what we have done is that uh, in in many of the implementing pro uh, programs you will see the the involvement of the private sector uh, and I, I should say that this the, the development of the, the document the technical committee that they did also had representative from agi uh, private enterprise foundation we have people from uh, all of the other sectors where um, uh, uh, the private sector, uh, you know, 
Very well, Professor Baule. I got your main points delivered there. It seems like we're having a few challenges hearing you clearly, but you are saying that you're hoping that these reforms tie in the citizenry and the private sector. So grateful for that. Let's turn to other stories now. Chairman of the People's National Convention has disputed a statement issued by the party's national treasurer, Akhan Adams, that the current commissioners of the Electoral Commission cannot be trusted to do good work ahead of the 2020 presidential and parliamentary elections. Bernard Mona, who spoke on News at 10 on Thursday, said the party is yet to meet on the issue. We are already in turmoil as a political party. And yes, there are many issues. And indeed, when I sent him, after I did my statement, I sent it to him for him to know that I was responding. Mm. We had some private conversation, which I do not want to bring. But bottom line is that you could have issued a statement as Akani Adam without making it the PNC position. And none of us, because first we are individual before um, ascending to, to a party. political party. And you could have an individual position on a certain matter. I would urge that when it comes to, look, if he, for instance, you invited me here. Mm. If it was that it was at the spur of the moment, that he decided to make a pronouncement. Then it is not a statement, but not when you have gone to meditate and scribble and then forward it. When you do know that you are, don't, you are not clothed with authority to I even see. issue statements on behalf of the party. Has the PNC met on this EC thing? No. Not yet. No. So the party doesn't have a position. We have not taken a position. I've seen people say, like, and I, I, I was speaking to somebody, I said, look, the PPP, for instance, have a position. Mm. And they met, and they decided the line of action that they have to take. Mm. So if anybody from the PP is speak, the PPP is speaking, it is, the person is speaking before because they have met. In our instance, we have not met. Mm. The fact that we have not met or we have not met over some period, does not qualify you to jump and go and issue a statement. It doesn't sit well. Why is the PNC silent on the EC? Uh, uh, I thought that you, we have been silent on a number of happenings in this country. But I'm interested in the, uh, the EC. Uh, you see, I, and I, have, I spoke this evening and I said, look, I think that we are missing Tama. You know Tama? Mm. Share fruits mm. and Dawa Dawa. Some people are jumbling, and the PNC suffered an unjust disqualification leading to the 2016 elections. Our hands were tied to the back. The MPP, NDC, and other political parties were on the field, navigating the length and breadth of this country. With less than 18 days to the election, the EC untied our hands and said, go and contest the elections. There is bitterness in us, because the votes that we could have captured somewhere we lost it because people said, look, we are no more participating. Some of them, because they said we are no more participating, jumped onto other political party candidates. And it was difficult for them to return to our fold when the Electoral Commission untied us. Mm. So I can understand the bitterness. And people want to say, because of what they did, they should be penalized. It is not the case that we are having today. The case that I am told is before the committee, mm -hmm. is that it is issues of procurement. Right. And really, issues of procurement are not the remit of the PNC. We are interested in matters of election. Now let's turn to the transport sector now. The Ministry of Railway Development as part of efforts to revive the rail sector is holding a stakeholders forum with Ghanaian rail consultants and experts. The move forms part of government's plan to revive and expand Ghana's rail system to boost productivity and reduce the impact of heavy duty trucks on Ghana's major transit roads. Now my colleague Selom Amina is with and has been speaking in fact with the Railways Minister Joe Gatte and consultant Adamu Mohammed and will be joining us shortly. He'll be joining us now in fact on that issue. Selom over to you now. The rail sector. Uh, the Ministry for Railways Development is actually holding a dialogue with experts who are actually Ghanaians but have been living in the UK, Europe and other places.
Well, we're getting back to Selom, and he'll be joining us in a more clear fashion there. To, he's been speaking with Railways Minister Joe Gatti and consultant Adamu Mohamed on the development of the rail sector here in Ghana. We've got some more news for you here on Midday Live shortly. Stay with us. Welcome back to Midday Live. On to some business news this afternoon. The largest ever car power ship, Osman Khan, has been inaugurated at the Tema Fishing Harbour. It has the capacity of generating 470 megawatts of power. According to Deputy Minister of Energy Joseph Kujo, the 470 megawatts power ship is replacing the 235 megawatt power ship. He hinted the car power ship Osman Khan will be relocated. The 470 megawatts power ship is one of the primary candidates expected to offtake gas from the Sankofa field when it is relocated to second day. Our technical teams are working frantically to assess the smooth relocation of the power ship to our gas supply source. He indicated with Ghana's power demand increasing by 10% annually, government will put up the necessary policies to ensure sustainable, accessible, reliable and affordable electricity. We want to achieve universal access to electricity through sustainable great expansion programs. We want to attain financial sustainability for the entire energy value chain through improved revenue collection and reduction of system losses. Implementing capital projects involving rehabilitation, expansion, upgrade and reinforcement of our transmission and distribution networks. Car Powership Ghana has reiterated its uninterrupted and consistent electricity to the national grid. The CEO of Car Powership Ohan Remzi Karadene said the presence of the Powership Osman Khan is the fulfillment of its obligation to ECG. We have been the most reliable power generation in Ghana since we started. We have achieved 100% availability. We have been the lowest cost thermal power generation in the country, the fastest deployed IPP. Karadeniz Powership Osman Han is 300 meters in length, 50 meters wide, highest efficiency in its class, combined cycle, dual fuel capabilities make it a unique example of its kind. The 470 megawatts capacity car power ship will be generating 450 megawatts. Together with all our stakeholders and government agencies, we have demonstrated that Ghana can execute and sustain cost-effective infrastructure projects transform its economy, optimize the utilization of its own natural resources, and reduce dependency on import sources. Now the news. Government says it will, from next month, automate operations at the Land Administration Administrative Secretariat to reduce man hours. The automation, according to government, is part of its decision to reform and transform the economy and reduce the cost of doing business. The formation of the Economic Club of Ghana was spearheaded by some students at the University of Ghana. The club is geared towards providing the platform for economic students to proffer solutions to Ghana's economic difficulties. Currently, government has decided to achieve 5% budget deficits before the end of this year. To achieve that, it has initiated a lot of reforms, including formalizing the economy to achieve the needed results. But business owners have complained about the difficulties in registering land titles to speed up their work. Most recently, they had to spend more than one week to get documents processed affecting economic growth. Based on that, Vice President Dr. Mohamed Baumia has indicated plans to reform operations at the land registry by next month. We are pushing very quickly to make sure we formalize the economy. You make sure that national ID cards are issued. It's going to be very critical uh, for the management of this economy, for the collection of taxes and so on, that everybody is uniquely identified. He again emphasized on government's decision to leverage on its natural resources to raise revenue. If we export raw bauxite, we get $60 per metric ton. 
If we refine it into aluminium, we get $350 per metric ton. And if we refine that aluminium, alumina into aluminium, we get $2,000 per metric ton. So the, 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 the clear path for us is to try and add value to these raw materials. A former Minister of Finance, Dr. Kwesibochi, lauded governments for stabilizing the economy and ensuring fiscal discipline. On the upside, I think that things are improving. But there are vulnerabilities. One of them has to do with finances of the energy sector state-owned enterprises. It is something that government must address. The VRA alone needs a tariff revision of at least 32% to just break even. Now, Justice of the Supreme Court, Vaida Akoto, has observed the practice whereby some auctioneers delay in selling property that are attached in the execution of court judgments adversely impacts on the work of the judiciary. She made the observation at the launch of the new name and logo of the Ghana Institute of Auctioneers in Accra. 3 million, are we done on a 3.25? 5.9 million, are we done, ladies and gents? This is the last call on 5.9 million. Sold subject to confirmation. The Auction Sales Act 1989, PNDC Law 230, enacted some 28 years ago, gives legal effect to the practice of the profession of auctioning in the country. Auctioneers have been responsible for the disposal of property of losing parties in civil proceedings and criminal trials in the courts. They also assist the judiciary to realize the funds needed to compensate the aggrieved parties in the execution of their judgments. At the launch of the transformation of the Ghana Auctioneers Association to Ghana Institute of Auctioneers, Justice of the Supreme Court, Vida Akoto, encouraged the auctioneers to execute their duties professionally and abide by the code of ethics of the profession. Public actions can now be conducted online. And interested buyers can participate from across the world in real time. I look forward to the day when the Ghana Institute of Oceanics will attain the necessary credibility and stature like its counterparts elsewhere in the developed world, such that its members can use their certification to practice in any part of the world. She indicated the auctioneers could not be proud of the current state of auctioneering in the country. The Justice of the Supreme Court noted most auctioneers operate without offices, recognize telephone numbers, let alone email addresses. National Secretary of Chartered Institute of Marketing UK, Abraham Tete Nate, pledged the Institute's support for the auctioneers. The need for branding, rebranding, so we can offer training in the area of branding to make the association uh, more attractive and marketable. President of the Ghana Institute of Auctioneers, Calvis Okain, cautioned members of being sanctioned for wrongdoing. He refuted allegations that auctioneers intentionally sell assets below acceptable prices. It is not the auctioneer. The thing started from somewhere. First, who valued it? Who sanctioned the reserve price? They value the thing, they submit the uh, reports to somebody, he goes into it. If he thinks it's okay, he sanctions it as a reserve price and give it to a shenya, go and auction. What do you think is going to happen? Well, let's turn to the aviation sector now. As flights to and from West Africa are being disrupted by a strike by Senegalese air traffic controllers, the stoppage at Dakar's international airport comes only a week after the airport opened. Hundreds of passengers have already been affected by the strike, which began at midnight GMT. Trade union leader Paul Francois said air traffic controllers were unhappy with the working conditions. According to him, civil aviation officials had ignored their request for compensation to cover the long travel times to the new airport, which is 50 kilometers from the capital, Dakar. The union leader said the 60 air traffic controllers had not been trained in the use of equipment in the new control tower. The Portuguese airline confirmed that its flights have been cancelled to and from Dakar. Other airlines are rerouting their flights to Banjul in the Gambia.
And that's all for the business news this afternoon on Midday Live. We've got more business news on our website, 3news.com. We've got more news for you on Midday Live shortly. Stay with us. In entertainment news this afternoon, cinema goers have every reason to be happy as the Xmas beckons. Season 2 of Within the Apartment, a comic TV series, will premiere on December 23 to entertain cinema goers. Ah, I'm going to do by this hair from. I have this crazy fashion show I'm telling this weekend and I want to put it on to slay the red carpet. I mean, you know, nah. I hope it's not at least. <laughs> The Xmas promises to be fun as the best of comic content have been lined up to amuse revelers. Season 2 of Within the Apartment, a comic TV series will premiere on December 23 at the West Hills Mall. Uh, you can sing, I, I'll listen to you. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Frank, <Yeah>. sing! <coughs> The fun-filled package tells the story of five friends with different temperament living under one roof. Expect one thing, petty quarrels or if you like, funny argument. And oh, the presence of a rather intrusive cleaner adds to both the fun and irritation. I learned laughing is even a medicine for the soul. Yeah. So to come to watch within the apartment just to put some smile on your face on the 23rd December. Now when we watch some of the episodes, we have some episodes where a, a guy maltreating a lady, which is not right. So when you watch the one we just watched, we get to know that the fair man was trying to defend the lady because it's not right for a man to maltreat a lady. So in terms of uh, coming now with social life is there. Within the apartment features both experience and promising acting talent. It's the end of the year and you have to make yourself happy. It's the birth month of Jesus Christ. They're going to really laugh, laugh and laugh. I mean, what better way do you want to end your year? Now, if you must know again, inside this bag, well, certainly promises to be very diverse and entertaining there. Wouldn't miss it. Thanks so much for watching Midday Live this afternoon. From the News Hub at this away Kanda, I'm Natalie Fort. We're grateful for your time this afternoon. We've got more news on our website. Just visit 3news.com. Thanks so much. Have a lovely day.